Hi, I'm Bob Herbert. Welcome to Op-Ed.TV. America considers itself to be a fair and just nation. But too often, in criminal matters, justice is little more than a crapshoot. You may get it, you may not. This is especially true for minorities and the poor. My guest, Brian Stevenson, has spent his entire adult life trying to shift the odds in the direction of greater fairness. Among many other things, he is one of the foremost death penalty lawyers of our time, and he is the author of a very well-received new book, Just Mercy, which chronicles the many challenges and some of the big triumphs of his unending quest for justice. Brian, welcome. Thank you. Thanks so much for doing this. I appreciate it. So you're the uh, founder and you're now the head of an organization called Equal Justice Initiative. That's in Montgomery, Alabama. Yes. Um, tell us what that is. It's a private nonprofit organization that provides legal services to the poor, the incarcerated, and the condemned. Uh, we started about 25 years ago because uh, Alabama is like several states. We don't have a a public defender system. There was no system for providing legal services to people on death row. And early in my career, I met people literally dying for legal assistance and, and watching men uh, at risk of execution simply because they couldn't get a lawyer. Uh, just really inspired me and some others to put this organization together and we've been working now for almost a quarter century. So once someone was uh, convicted and condemned to die and then you get into the appeal process, mm -hmm. Did those prisoners not have a constitutional right to a lawyer? Yeah, it's a really good question. Most people don't understand this. The Supreme Court in 1963 created a right to counsel for poor people, but that was for the trial. After the trial was over, the court extended the right to the initial appeal to the state's highest court. After that, there is no right to counsel, even for people on death row. And the problem with that is that if you got a bad lawyer, the opportunity to prove that your lawyer was bad comes in these collateral appeals. If you have new evidence of innocence, the opportunity to present that evidence comes in these new collateral appeals. In the death penalty, we've now had 147 people proved innocent after being sentenced to death. That means for every 10 people who have been executed, we've identified one innocent person on death row who's been released. But the only way those men and women were exonerated was by finding lawyers, mostly volunteer lawyers, uh, to present the evidence that showed that they'd been wrongly convicted. And there is no right to counsel, even for these innocent people who are trying to present new evidence in court. And it's created a real crisis, a continuing crisis, on how the death penalty is applied. How did you get into death penalty work? Because you came out of Harvard Law School. Yeah. Uh, what year was it? Uh, 85 was my graduation. Yeah. And the... Uh, general opinion is you come out of Harvard Law and basically you've got it made, <laughs> yeah. especially then go out and make the big bucks. Yeah. You chose not to do that. Well, you know, I grew up in a poor community, uh, in a rural community. I started my education in a colored school. I was in a uh, part of the South where the schools weren't open to black children when I started my education. And I remember lawyers coming into our community and opening up the public school. This was even after Brown versus Board of Education. That's right. This was in the 60s. And yet, in many parts of the country, Brown was never fully implemented for 15, 20 years. And that intervention by lawyers had a huge impact on my consciousness, but I never thought I was going to be a lawyer. And to be honest, I went to law school, I was a philosophy major in college, and I, I realized that nobody was going to pay me to philosophize when I graduated. <laughs> I went to law school because you didn't really need to know anything to go to law school, and I was quickly disillusioned by it because they weren't really talking about race and poverty or even justice. Uh, but I took a course that sent me to the Deep South as part of an internship. I met an extraordinary lawyer by the name of Steve Bright who ran a group called the Southern Prisoners Defense Committee and I was so engaged by the work that they were doing and then I met condemned people and these condemned men and women who had so clearly been wrongly treated and unfairly prosecuted uh, their plight really became my plight. I couldn't disconnect from the struggles that I saw them engaged in and that's what turned it around for me. When I got back to law school I knew I wanted to go back to the South and help condemn people and to represent their humanity, their quest for justice. And, and, and you've just stayed with this ever since then. Exactly, yeah. Now, um, you, you're opposed to the death penalty as I am. Mm -hmm. um, what, what are your main arguments against capital punishment? Well, you know, I think in this country, uh, the question of the death penalty can't really be resolved by asking, do people deserve to die for the crimes that they've committed? I think the threshold question is, do we deserve to kill? 
And I think when you ask that question, even people who might believe in the death penalty theoretically have to say, we don't deserve to kill. We have a criminal justice system that treats you better if you're rich and guilty than if you're poor and innocent. Wealth, not culpability, shapes outcomes. We have a criminal justice system that's compromised by racial bias and discrimination. Uh, we have a, a criminal justice system that's been distorted by the politics of fear and anger and these political considerations shape which cases end up as death cases and which cases don't. And all of these dynamics create tremendous unreliability. This error rate is shocking. Uh, in no other area of public, uh, just public administration would we tolerate the rate of error that we find in the death penalty context. Right. If for every 10 planes it took off, one crashed, nobody would fly. And yet we tolerate it here. And so for me, the death penalty really is about do we deserve to kill? Have we invested enough into our system, created a system fair and reliable enough that we can impose a perfect punishment, which is the death penalty, because we can't recover if we make mistakes. And we don't do that. And you really don't have to go much beyond that, in my judgment, uh, to conclude that the death penalty is not something we should be imposing. One of the things that I think is not well understood, you mentioned ra racial bias, is that it's the race of the victim, mm -hmm. not of the defendant, mm -hmm. that is the greatest predictor of who gets the death penalty. Can you talk about that a little sure, bit? Sure, yeah. I mean, well, one of the challenges we have in this country is that we've never really confronted uh, the legacy of racial inequality. And there's this residue that actually I think goes all the way back to the time of slavery that we've not talked about. And because of that, there are these presumptions of guilt and dangerousness that get assigned uh, to people of color. And we had this era between Reconstruction and World War II, which was dominated by terrorism. We used uh, executions, lynchings to express this, uh, this kind of uh, this ideology of racial control, and it continues to manifest itself. And so we value crimes committed against people who are white uh, much more highly than crimes committed against people who are black. So it's, 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 a, um, it's more heinous if you do something to a white person That's right. than if you do something, the same thing, to an African American. That's exactly right. Uh, the, the studies show that in several states, you're 22 times more likely to get the death penalty if the victim is white than if the victim is black. Race of defendant still has some impact. Uh, you're uh, even more likely to get the death penalty if the defendant is black and the victim is white. And these data have been consistent and uh, clearly established for almost 30 years. Even at the time of Furman in 1972, 87% uh, of the people who had been executed for the crime of rape were black men convicted of raping white women. 100% of the people executed for that offense were executed for crimes involving victims who were white, even though women of color were believed to be three times as likely to be the victims of sexual assault. And explain what Furman is. Was. Furman was the first case where the Supreme Court in 1972 declared the death penalty unconstitutional. Uh, the court said the death penalty was arbitrary and capricious. What they really said was the death penalty is connected to our history of slavery and terror and uh, racial segregation. It was a tool. It was a kind of a consequence of all of that animosity and racial hierarchy. And they struck it down. They didn't say it was cruel and unusual punishment in all circumstances. And there was a tremendous backlash to the courts banning the death penalty in 1972. And so four years later, the court upheld the death penalty and created the modern death penalty era, uh, which really began in 1976 in a set of cases. It's that era that we are still coping with. It's that new set of laws that have ushered in uh, almost over 1,400 executions and all of these problems that we currently talk about. Now, the main narrative thread in your book mm -hmm. is the story of a gentleman named Walter McMillan. Yes. And uh, it's, a, it's a long story, yeah. but it's a powerful one. Mm -hmm. So as concisely as possible, sure. Tell us what happened. Well, um, Walter, there was a murder in Monroeville, Alabama, of a young white woman uh, in downtown Monroeville, and the community was outraged. Uh, she was a very prominent, from a prominent family. The police couldn't solve the crime, and after seven months, I believe they were getting pressured so much that they decided to arrest someone, even if they weren't persuaded that that person was guilty. Uh, gun sales had increased. They were talking about impeaching some of the law enforcement officers. And they arrested Mr. McMillan, not because he had a criminal history. He was a 45-year-old African-American with no history of violent crime. I think they arrested him because he was having an interracial affair with a young white woman. And uh, what was remarkable about this case were three big things for me was that um, they actually put him on death row for 15 months before the trial to create a consciousness of guilt, a narrative of dangerousness. They actually 
put him on death row. I have to interrupt you. Yes. <laughs> he's on death row before he's convicted? It's the only case I've ever worked on where they actually put the person, the accused, on death row without being convicted of any crime. Completely illegal, completely unconstitutional, but that's what they did. So the newspapers would say death row defendant Walter McMillan will be arraigned tomorrow, or death row defendant has filed these kinds of pleadings. That was the first thing. The second thing was that he had a very, very complete and compelling a defense. He was actually with his family and about 20 other people at a fish fry uh, 11 miles away when the crime took, took place. So everybody knew in the black community that he was innocent. The thing that was remarkable for me was that this community in Monroeville is the same community where Harper Lee grew up and wrote To Kill a Mockingbird. And if you go to Monroeville, <laughs> you'll see this community saturated with all of the names and marketing that story. They put on a play each year. The streets are named after characters. They love that story. And yet, they were comfortably convicting an innocent African-American and moving him toward execution. And, and To Kill a Mocking, Mockingbird is a novel about a black man who was falsely accused That's of right. raping a white woman. That's right. And it's a celebrated novel. It's a beautiful story and a beautiful novel. But they celebrate the role of the lawyer in that case, Atticus Finch, even though he doesn't actually achieve justice for his client. The client is ultimately convicted and is actually killed in the last chapter of the story. And it's that disconnect that bothered me so much. Uh, the judge was a guy named Robert E. Lee Key. And when I got involved in the case, he told me not to get involved. He didn't want me involved. Oh, the judge didn't want you involved. The judge did not want me involved. He didn't want any outsiders messing this up. Case was, uh, the, the jury convicted him in a day and a half. Uh, they actually gave him life without parole. The jury... Impose the sentence of life without parole, but Alabama is one of three states that allows our elected trial judges to override jury verdicts of life. And so Judge Robert E. Lee Key overrode the jury's verdict of life and imposed the death penalty. And Mr. McMillan spent the next six years on death row while eight people were executed. He would talk about seeing people move down the hall, placed in the electric chair. He said he could smell their flesh burning during these executions. Deeply traumatic experience for him. And we ultimately proved his innocence by uh, getting tapes uh, where witnesses had been coerced to testify against him falsely. And for some bizarre reason, they actually recorded the sessions <laughs> where they were coercing the witnesses to testify falsely and didn't destroy the tapes. So I actually got tapes where the witness was saying, quote, you want me to frame an innocent man for murder, and I don't feel right about that. This is on tape? On tape. And the police officer was saying, well, if you don't give us what we want, we'll put you on death row. And we had a lot of very dramatic evidence. All of the witnesses admitted that their testimony was false, and we ultimately won his release, even though... Uh, after presenting that evidence, courts kept saying, no, he should still be executed. A really challenging case of an innocent person, and we got death threats and bomb threats and all kinds of resistance, uh, even when we were representing somebody clearly innocent. And that's what the death penalty does. It so corrupts our sense of doing the right thing, our moral values, that you begin to see these very bizarre things. And I think the McMillan case is a very clear example of but that. But ultimately, you prevailed. Yes, we did. Uh, we were able to uh, present this evidence. We got the state actually to reopen the case. And when they investigated, they quickly concluded that he was innocent. And based on that, uh, we were able to get all the charges dismissed against him. But it never really freed him entirely. You can't try to kill somebody every day of their life for six years and not have it create long-term injury and suffering. Right. The aftermath of his story is, is a tragic one. Yeah. So um, tell us about that. Well, he, you know, he did really well. We got him out. We uh, spent a lot of time together. Uh, but about uh, 10 years after he had been out, he started showing signs of dementia. And the doctors concluded that it was what we call trauma-induced uh, dementia. Uh, and, uh, you know, he had some happy years, but uh, uh, died uh, not too long ago after really losing his awareness of what was going on. And one of the hardest things for me was uh, spending time with him in a facility where he thought he was back on death row and how heartbreaking that was uh, for him and for me. And we do damaging things to people when we wrongly accuse them, when we convict them wrongly, when we put them on death row. We celebrate these exonerations as as if somehow we've done something noble and wonderful, but we've done something terrible. And I believe there has never been a time in American history 
uh, where there are more innocent people in jails and prisons than there are today. Uh, I think that's something, uh, another point that's not well understood by the public at large, the yeah. number of people who are actually imprisoned that's who right. are innocent, who never committed the crimes that they were convicted for. Yeah. And in many of those cases, you'll find uh, police misconduct, mm -hmm. prosecutorial misconduct, sometimes judicial mm -hmm. uh, misconduct. And what I found as a reporter over many years is that it is almost impossible yeah. to get anyone to acknowledge yeah. that they had made a serious error or <laughs> certainly that they had behaved egregiously. Why is that, especially in, in death penalty cases? Yeah. It's not just somebody's freedom, but someone's life is at stake. Yeah. What about the humanity of the prosecutors or the judges? Well, this is where the politics of death becomes such a barrier to justice. Uh, I mean, we've had this tremendous transformation in American society. We've gone from a prison population of 300,000 in 1972 to 2.3 million people today. We have the highest rate of incarceration in the world, and we're not ashamed of that. And we're not ashamed because we've got politicians preaching to us that we should be afraid and angry and this is the right thing to do and that they should trust us in putting all of these people in jails and prisons. When you expose innocent people wrongly convicted, it questions that issue of trust. And so rather than acknowledge that they're making these mistakes, they do everything they can in too many instances to try to deny that any mistake has been made, even when it's quite obvious. And frankly, it's gotten harder in the last 10 years, uh, during the time when we uh, succeeded in getting Mr. McMillan released in the 1990s, there was actually a, it was relatively new, and people were more likely to acknowledge error than they are today. Now it's become, I think, quite the norm for people to just keep pushing and denying and resisting. And that creates a system that is at great risk of just unbelievable injustice and inequality. You mentioned the feeling of uh, heartbreak that you experienced um, with Mr. McMillan mm -hmm. in his later years. Mm -hmm. How do you maintain mm -hmm. an emotional distance from clients mm -hmm. who, one, are facing death mm -hmm. and who, in many cases, are actually put to death? Yeah. What, what's the impact on you? Well, it's hard. I don't think there's any question about it. But I don't necessarily think that emotional distance uh, actually makes it easier. I don't have a problem embracing the clients and getting close to them and wanting to fight for them. Because in some ways, I really do believe that we're all more than the worst thing we've ever done. I mean, what my clients have taught me is that each of us is more than the worst thing we've ever done. If you tell a lie, you're not just a liar. If you take something, you're not just a thief. Even if you kill somebody, you're not just a killer. And so I actually want to see them live. I think that my work is tied to their life. And when they fall, I fall a little bit. When they are killed, a little part of my quest for humanity is killed. And so I don't try to create distance. I try to embrace that. And what's, I think, helpful for me is that I live in Montgomery, Alabama, and I am surrounded by the legacy and the witness of <laughs> thousands of people who yeah, got close right. to suffering and inequality and injustice and fought and fought and fought. And I think their witness empowers me. As hard as my job has been, and it's been difficult at times, I've never had to say my head is bloody but not bowed <laughs> like those folks right. who came before me. And I think that's what animates me and what empowers me and energizes me to know that even though it's difficult, we've got to keep fighting uh, to protect uh, the humanity of all of our, our all of our citizens. Now you've had many successes. Mm -hmm. um, you've had um, uh, many instances when you've saved people from execution, mm -hmm. when you've proved innocent and mm -hmm. had people released from prison. But you also had a couple of triumphs in the juvenile justice yeah. area. Can you talk about that? Sure. My clients have gotten younger and younger. And in the late 80s, we started uh, putting uh, thousands of children in the adult criminal justice system. Today, we've got 250,000 kids serving long prison sentences for crimes they, they committed as juveniles. We started challenging these death in prison sentences. We were executing kids until 2005. So we took up this question of whether it's constitutional to impose life imprisonment without parole on children. Uh, and we won a case in 2010, Graham versus Florida, that banned life without parole sentences for children convicted of non-homicides. We had almost 200. And then in 2012, we won a case that actually ended mandatory uh, death in prison sentences for children. We've got about 2,500 kids in this country, some as young as 13 and 14, that have been condemned to die in prison in mandatory schemes where the judge wasn't even permitted to consider the age of the child. That's now unconstitutional. And I'm really energized by those decisions because there's a lot more work we need to do uh, to, to change our system as it deals with children and child status. 
you've also worked on issues having to do with the mentally ill. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned in the book that um, our uh, prisons and our jails have become sort of the default warehouses for the mentally ill. It's absolutely true. About 50% of people in jails and prisons today have serious mental health disorders. They are seriously mentally disabled. 20% have severe disabilities. We deconstructed mental health facilities and institutions, and that meant that for affluent people, m more resource people, that they could get care in private settings. For the poor, it meant that they were wandering around, and many of them have been arrested, and they're now being warehoused in jails and prisons. And the last place uh, we should send someone with a serious mental disability or disorder is a jail or prison where they won't get treatment, they won't get care, they'll be brutalized, and they'll exposed uh, be exposed to all the violence and trauma. So it's one of the great challenges we face. And if you ask most wardens or jailers what their biggest challenge is, they'll tell you it's dealing with this very large population of mentally disabled people that are now filling our jails and prisons. This is a question I should be asking myself, but I'll ask you because yeah. I'm the host. Yes. Um, <laughs> why doesn't the press mm. pay more attention to these issues that you've written about in your book, that you've devoted your career to, which are important important public policy issues and which are in many cases just simply outrageous. Yeah. Why not more coverage? Well, I think part of it has to do with their exploitation of this fear and anger narrative. The um, press is exploitation. Yes, exactly. I think for local TV stations throughout this country, uh, they have been reinforced into believing that the more they can keep viewers afraid and angry, the more they're going to tune in. Uh, and whether we're talking about severe threats right. from weather or severe threats of crime. And so they've actually contributed to the narrative that all we have is a, is a kind of this violence and, and anger. And they don't tell you that the crime rate is actually lower than it's been in 40 years. And so that's part of it. The second part of it is that we actually have to do difficult things to investigate these kinds of stories. Our prisons are not accessible. There's no transparency. You have to understand the complexity of this system. And for a lot of reporters, that makes it hard. And if it's hard, in too many places, journalists don't do the hard thing. And so we've got to make it easier for people to understand uh, the difficulties that are being created by over-incarceration. That's one of the reasons why I wrote a book, because I really want people to get closer uh, to what I see. I think if most people saw what I see, they'd feel very differently about these issues. If we were to commit ourselves to real reform mm -hmm. of the criminal justice system, mm -hmm. where would you start? What are some of the things you'd like to see happen? Well, I think we have about a million people in jails and prisons who are not a threat to public safety. They've been put in prison for uh, drug dependency, for uh, drug trafficking, uh, for low-level nonviolent crimes. I think we should get those people out of jail or prison we would save about forty billion dollars there's no reason why we can't do it in the next six or seven years and that will create a less cramped a less overwhelmed criminal justice system that might do better in reaching the right results in cases where there does need to be an intervention right. the second thing i think we should do is just eliminate these excessive punishments if we stopped the death penalty we would save millions and millions of dollars and create space to do a better job of adjudicating guilt and innocence throughout the system I think eliminating excessive punishment and over-incarceration is a necessary one-two punch to kind of create uh, the space and, and atmosphere we need for more justice. Have you ever been disappointed in clients, men or women, who um, continue to behave badly um, even as you were working hard on their behalf? Yeah, I don't know that disappointment is the word. I've certainly represented lots of people. I've got a client who was uh, 13 years of age who was put in solitary confinement to shield him from the dangers of an adult population. And he was stayed in solitary con confinement for 18 years. And he's struggling to do better, hard to do. And he doesn't because he's been traumatized and abused. And that damage that has been done to him makes it very hard for him to succeed. And I'm frustrated by that, but I can't say I'm disappointed in him. We've done something destructive. We've got too many kids growing up in violent communities where they're being chased by violent gangs, they're going to violent schools, then they react violently, and then we intervene and throw them away. We've got to disrupt that behavior. We've got to understand the context. And I think when you contextualize it, you're not disappointed, you're committed to creating new pathologies for the people who are most at risk. Well, uh, Brian, we've run out of time. Thank you for coming in. Um, the book is called Just Mercy, and it's terrific. I appreciate it. Talk Thank to you, you again soon. Thank you. Uh, we'll be back in a moment with a final word.
The number of homeless children in America has reached an all-time high. For some reason, the press has not considered that to be a big story. I disagree. And I urge all Americans to go online and take a look at the report, America's Youngest Outcasts, by the National Center on Family Homelessness. Two and a half million American children were homeless at some point in 2013. They were living in shelters or doubled up with relatives or friends or, in worst case scenarios, they were sleeping in parks, in cars, or on the street. In New York City, more than 50,000 homeless people are jammed into our shelters every night, and tons more are turned away. Many of those folks are children. I can't be the only one who thinks there is something utterly perverse about stock markets and corporate profits being at record highs at the same time that we're also setting records for children who don't even have a home address. That's all for now. See you next time.